Hi, Serge. Looks like your uh, beard is, Corey, growing. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. Mine too. Yeah. I'm Corey Grow, senior writer for Rolling Stone, and I just had a great conversation with Serge Tonkin about System of a Down's two new songs, the conflict in Artsakh, and how the band uses activism in their music. How would you describe just the, kind of the, the year you've been having here? Likely the worst year of my life. Um, not to under or overemphasize, I guess. Um, it's been a very incredibly challenging year, um, both physically, mentally, emotionally, um, internationally, politically, socially, economically. I've had a lot of health things happen and, and over the years from the beginning of the year till now, uh, family uh, problems with COVID and stuff like that. I lost an uncle in New York, um, friends that I've, you know, seen go, go and, um, you know, and, and, you know, the, Ar the whole Armenia Artsakh, you know, invasion of Azerbaijan and all those deaths and humanitarian catastrophe that I try to work on daily. Um, so it's, it's, you know, yeah, but look, it's, you know, I've, I've thought about this. Is, is it the year, you know, or is it just it, it's time in time in our lives, whatever, for whatever reason, you know, mm -hmm. um, there's definitely, I think, huge currents happening in the world, um, which are um, in the, in the short term, extremely negative. Um, hopefully in the long term, they will be positive, you know, because there's always um, upheaval before change. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I still have hope that in the next three, four, five years, we'll be living a different direction on this planet, um, more cognizant of our role um, within this ecosystem, more cognizant of our um, experience as human beings. But I'm not sure, and I wouldn't bet my life on it. <laughs> You see people making these mistakes all year long, um, whether it's government people or friends who might not be, who, who might think they're invincible or those sorts of things. Like, where, where, where do you find that hope? I have to have hope because I have a child, you know, and to contemplate a world that's going to be worse for him than me is unthinkable. Um, so I have to have hope that, that it will be better for him. Um, and that's literally the only, um, it's kind of like forced hope. How have you been generally holding up with quarantine? Because, you know, you hear about your friends and stuff like that, but you got, you know, you said you're a father, you know, you have to make decisions for yourself too. How, how have you and your family been handling everything since uh, March? You know, thank, thankfully, I'm very grateful uh, to be in a place where, you know, uh, we, we, first of all, we were in New Zealand for nine months and we quarantined there for about two and a half, three months. Um, New Zealand had done a very incredibly strict quarantine with proper contact tracing, uh, great communication by the government, a lot of responsible reaction from the people and led to, you know, although it's an island nation with no porous borders, it led to a complete, you know, basically, um, you know, loss of community transmission. So there is no COVID, they just have COVID at the border and they have two week quarantines, forced quarantines, hotels, government mandated, et cetera. So after two, two and a half months, we literally went back into stage one, which is normal, normal existence, I guess. No, no masks, no social distancing, schools open. Um, but then we decided to come back to Los Angeles uh, voluntarily. We missed family. I hadn't seen my parents in nine months. They're older. They've been cooped up, you know, in their condo for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, my wife missed her nieces and all that. It, it was difficult without family. And also the, uh, the attack on Artsakh had started and we were working diligently starting in New Zealand to try to gain attention, raise funds and do all these things. And it was difficult not being in a community doing the same thing. So coming back to Los Angeles, being within the confines of the, you know, Armenian American community here, all rallying together was, was important at the same time. And so for those two reasons, we came back. Since New Zealand was sort of like the bastion for the way that this should be handled, how did you handle the fears or the worries about returning to LA? Um, yeah, there were some of those inhibitions, but it's, it's, it's really interesting what thresholds mean, you know, like the threshold of the fear of COVID was nothing compared to the um, brutality of the war that was started against Armenians in Artsakh. So, when that started, I kind of forgot about COVID. You know, we put on our masks, got on the plane, 
made sure that we were as safe as possible, came back, got tested and all that, and tried to be very, you know, homebound as much as possible. But we hadn't been in LA for nine months, so we saw family and whatnot, but carefully. Um, but we we totally, I got to say, you know, there we were so crushed by what was going on in Artsakh and Armenia um, with the aggression of the Turkish Azeri forces with Syrian mercenaries, you know, uh, brutally bombing civilian headquarters in Artsakh, uh, civilian infrastructure, killing people indiscriminately. We were just like, we weren't thinking about COVID, to be honest. So it's interesting how uh, different thresholds of danger, different thresholds of what you consider personally, um, you know, important, outweigh each other to a point where you can completely dismiss the other without completely forgetting about it, obviously. You mentioned wanting to obviously be part of a community again and, and react to what's going on in Artsakh. Uh, what, what was different? What is, what has changed since you've been back? Like it, it, you know, who have you been talking to? How have you been getting more active? Obviously you recorded the songs with the band. Uh, what else, what else have you been doing? Well, from the first day of the war, I was, I just started doing press to get, help get the word out because when Azerbaijan and Turkey attacked on September 27th of this year, they not only attacked with weapons, but they also attacked with propaganda. Um, you know, at first they blamed Armenia for starting the war, which wasn't true because they had to come to where the Armenians were to attack, which so it was, you know, um, and then they, for each ceasefire, they've broken four or five ceasefires so far. And for each ceasefire, they would immediately blame Armenia. Um, Armenia didn't have the same financial wherewithal of a uh, petrol rich dictatorship, Azerbaijan, to spend on media, to spend on ads that would garner them the type of uh, favoritism that they did not deserve as a brutal dictatorship. Um, so, you know, they had planned this all along. They had spent the money. Um, they had done what's known as caviar diplomacy in Europe and around the world, which is basically whining and dining different diplomats, politicians to, uh, you know, curry favor, um, including European parliamentarians, which uh, has been uh, quite exposed over the last number of years uh, in this thing called the Azerbaijani laundromat, where they showed millions of dollars being, hundreds of million dollars being spent on currying favors and bribing politicians. Um, and so, you know, they they planned this this whole attack, not just in a military sense, but in a full kind of integral sense, including propaganda, misinformation, et cetera. So from day one, I was trying to do press and get the word out about what's really going on, talking to the human rights ombudsman in Artsakh, in Armenia, you know, getting reports from them, talking to journalists there, um, friends in Armenia, kind of, you know, trying to following press uh, of what's happening on the ground. Vice News did an incredible piece early on in the war uh, in Stepanagerd when they went in and the bombs were falling down and then BBC went in. Darren had sent an email from System of a Down saying, guys, we have to make a statement with the band as well and say what's going on so our fans uh, are aware. And, and we were like, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so we made a statement early on online and pointed out to a number of nonprofit organizations that people can help donate to, uh, calls to action politically within the US specifically that they can participate in, etc. And then uh, a couple of weeks after that, John had sent a text saying, guys, we haven't put out music in 15, 16 years. And, you know, our people need us. I think we should we should do something. We should put out a song about what's going on. And we all jumped on board immediately saying, what a great idea. Absolutely. Let's do this. Um, Darren already had a song that he had written for that uh, in, in that context um, for his own solo record for Scars on Broadway. And he shared that song with us saying that this might work. And, and, and indeed it did, it was the song called Protect the Land. And uh, so we all jumped on board immediately and recorded our parts to the song. And then Genocidal Humanoids was a second song that um, the three guys had worked on previously a few years back um, and uh, just kind of, you know, in the pocket and, and it was a heavier song. So one became about the soldiers who protected their families and their, you know, indigenous homeland and protect the land. And then the other song was genocidal humanoids, countries that have, um, you know, committed genocide like Turkey during the Ottoman days, uh, 105 years ago, against our people, the Armenians, against the Assyrians, the Greeks, and also Azerbaijan, both countries who still today deny 
the Armenian genocide. Not just deny it, but uh, President of Turkey Erdogan has made statements saying we will continue the work of our ancestors in relations to the Armenian genocide. He's made it very clear. I mean, his his threats are not very uh, shielded. Um, so for Armenians, this battle has been an existential one because we knew that if they broke through, that they were going to you know massacre our people, and they have. They have massacred our people. There's videos of them uh, beheading soldiers, beheading civilians, cutting arms off, just killing, you know, prisoners of war and all of that. It's really brutal. It's happening until now, even after the ceasefire where they have, you know, if they catch a civilian that's left behind in the areas that were handed over to them as part of the ceasefire, they become POWs or they're killed or they're beheaded, like, or tortured. And, uh, it's really, really brutal. You and I obviously did an interview prior to the songs coming out, and we talked about a lot of those things. Uh, mm -hmm. It's my duty as a journalist, obviously, to, to independently, tr independently try to verify these sorts of things. And I did a lot of poking around on the internet. I tried to find stuff on the New York Times. I tried to find stuff on uh, other mainstream outlets. And it was, it was actually pretty difficult. And I even felt like the Times' coverage was maybe a little more slanted towards Azerbaijan. BBC as well. Right, I noticed BBC that too. As well. How do you go about vetting news? How do you go about knowing what is the truth and what to believe? Because this is such a difficult situation. There's a few really very reliable uh, investigative journal sources within Armenia. HETQ is one of them, um, and uh, they they are always they're they're one of you know every country has investigative journalists that have won awards and that have their own media companies. Every country has those. They're part of this global, you know, investigative journalist uh, society. They, they're the ones that always reveal corruption against their own governments and all of that stuff. So there's a few organizations like that that I follow within Armenia that, that have always been very, you know, on point. That's one. Two, there's been, um, you know, non-Armenian uh, war correspondents and bloggers that were on the ground that I would follow on Twitter that you know from the uk or from russia or from elsewhere that were basically on the line of contact with soldiers and seeing what was going on and reporting back some were you know beneficial to armenian perspective and some weren't they were very honest about things but so i was following that I was following armenian news i would even look at Azeri news sometimes to see what they're feeding to to understand the disinformation and all that of course i would read the new york times of course i would read the guardian of course i would read the Washington Post and all of that stuff as well, BBC and Al Jazeera. And I got to say that they, the, you know, Azerbaijan had their media manipulation locked in pretty well, um, which is why the media had been presenting things with false parody from day one. In fact, just that first thing of them claiming Armenia attacked rather than the truth, which is Azerbaijan and Turkey attacked Armenia, that took about two weeks during the war, that's 14 days of brutal war, for the media to kind of go, oh, okay, this is kind of the truth, you know? Like, so the media was catching up weeks, if not months later, you know, uh, to what was going on, including the war crimes that were committed, including all of that. So um, that is a testament to one, during COVID, nobody wanted to go there. So you couldn't have true investigative journalism. So you'd have to rely on whatever source on the ground that you want to replicate. Um, so if one source said something, they would all print the same thing, irrespective of how true or not true it was. Um, and so that brings another point is, is it a war crime to attack a country for whatever reason during a pandemic around the world? You know, uh, in my opinion, Azerbaijan and Turkey have committed numerous war crimes, starting with the actual attack during a pandemic. Um, not to mention the beheadings, the uh, use of cluster munition, munitions and indiscriminate bombing of civilian areas, infrastructure, journalists, you know. So, look, it's been really, really horrible. But yeah, my, my way of gathering truth is very, very uh, integral. Um, I, I cut through the BS, yeah. Obviously, you put out these songs to raise awareness for the, everything that's going on. Uh, first off, I guess, just to begin with, how how... How do you feel about the reaction to these? Do you feel like the fans have kind of understood why you did that and understood the messages there? 
Absolutely. I mean, you know, system fans uh, have responded incredibly positively. And, you know, some people obviously are always into the music, not as much the message, but this message could not be, you know, uh, unseen because, you know, we actually even talked about it um, on our own in a video explaining why this is important to us and, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, you know, how, how imperative this is for our people and what a human and humanitarian catastrophe it is, why we're doing this. We made it very clear that this was more an act of activism rather than a musical journey, you know, uh, using music. And, and because it was that um, important, it was that much of a danger for us all collectively. Um, so I think, you know, people have had incredible response. Um, the video uh, is so emotional for protect the land that you know um, people have responded with tears and and uh, you know wanting to find out more and disbelief at what's going on um you know revulsion at the uh you know at at the aggression of, of of azerbaijan and turkey and all of that so it's been you know it's been i couldn't have asked for a better kind of um way of reaching out to people and letting them know of the truth of what's going on and uh, the reaction. Obviously, one of the missions for System of a Down was to, uh, to raise awareness about Armenia and Armenia's history and, and these sorts of issues. Uh, was that, I mean, was that the case, you know, when you guys formed what, over two decades ago? Was that something that you went into it knowing that you wanted to raise awareness about? Funny thing is something we never, we've never talked about, you know? Um, so when we formed the band, it was a musical adventure um, more than anything. We never sat down and go, oh, this is so we can accomplish this or accomplish that. It was like four musicians in LA getting together, finding common ground, having fun, and creating really crazy music that at the time people were like, oh, I'll never hear this on the radio, you know, um, right. before, right? Like it just completely, it's not something you plan on, nor the success, whatever that means, nor, um, you know, nor what, how it ends up, you know, it's like you start somewhere, you end up somewhere, right? And it's a journey. Um, so no, we never planned on any of that. But because all of us were, you know, Armenian Americans with roots to our people, and the issue of the, you know, the the taboo nature of the recognition of the genocide within a well known democracy like the US became an issue for us. And we're like, why the hell wouldn't the US reckon, you know, we're in a democracy Why? why, why would the U.S. not properly recognized the Armenian genocide, and the, you know Congress finally, in complete form, recognized the Armenian genocide in December of 2019, just late last year, about a year ago. And so, uh, as you know, as some, as as a group of musicians who who have been working um, on that for a long time, we were extremely happy, extremely happy, um, and you know. So, but no, it's not something we ever planned. It's something that just kind of, you know, I personally was an activist before becoming an artist, you know, not all the guys were, you know, but that's been my thing. And because, you know, the majority of the lyrical, I guess, uh, um, responsibility over the years fell into my lap, it ended up, a lot of our songs ended up with socio-political commentary. Well, that's one of the things that I always liked about the band is that you were able to marry activism with absurdism you know you have like these totally absurd things and then you have something like prison song um that has a you know obviously a very clear message to it that was something that just evolved naturally where you're just like i'm gonna write a song about this that's right yeah no you know um it it it, it totally evolved naturally it's not something that we planned um you know it's 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 kind of interesting um because yeah i think i i like how you said we melded uh, activism with absurdity really well, and that's that's unique to System of a Down. It's it's kind of like Zappa. What Zappa would do, I guess, in some ways, make statements, um, but but also have, you know, intricately absurd music um, integrated into into that. Um, we didn't plan on anything, you know. Um, I think when you follow your muse, when you when you follow your kind of vision, and you're always truthful then you don't really plan on what you're doing. You just follow that and you end up where you end up. And, you know, and, and that's how it is. And it's the uh, conglomeration of our four energies as human beings, as artists, as, uh, you know, people that have created what System of a Down is. Messaging, 
musically, performance wise, drama, whatever you want to call it, everything. I love that you mentioned Zappa because when I was listening to System recently, I, I thought of that phrase, does humor belong in music? I hear that compilation that came out at one point, you know? Yeah. It's like, you can have fun and you can, you can headbang and you can do all those things at the same time and, you can, and it can be funny. And yeah, it can be. It can <laughs> be. And, and look, you know, with System, I think journalists love to pick up on the social uh, commentary because, you know, there are certain bands that do it well as well, but it's not the majority of music musicians that do it. So I think it's something people pick up on. But like you said, you know, we have a lot of stream of consciousness songs, uh, you know, experiential songs, um, you know, uh, and, you know, love songs and, and all sorts of stuff. We're not Rage Against the Machine where it's all against the machine. You know, we're a system of a down and, you know, we have a little bit of all of that kind of which which makes us unique. Um, but so did The Clash, you know, so did many other amazing bands that had socio-political, um, you know, um, commentary, but it wasn't their, their only shtick. I remember when we spoke around the songs coming out, I'd asked you if you'd felt creative or if you were working on any other music at the time. And you said, no, that with everything going on in, in the world, especially in, in, in Artsakh, that you can't feel creative. And when was the last time you felt creative and uh, how do you find that during like situations like this right now? Cause I remember you did a yeah. song called art sock about six years ago or something like that. Yeah. 2016, I did a song in Armenian called art sock and I released it with a video. And at the beginning of the war, I had a little demo video of it that I had just recorded and I released that and et cetera. Yeah, you're right, Corey. I haven't, because of what's happened and the injustice and the, and also the constant work, interviews, fundraisers, um, media, going, you know, uh, calls to action. I, my mind is not, I, my heart is not uh, comfortable enough to actually sit down and play an instrument, if you can believe it or not. The other day, the family went somewhere and I was alone in the house and I sat down on the piano and I played the piano and man, it was like incredible therapy because I hadn't touched it in such a long time. The last time I was extremely productive musically was during the lockdown and when I was in New Zealand because I had all this time and all my projects were canceled the system tour that we were supposed to do in 2020 was canceled the um I had two film premieres that were canceled two art exhibits that were canceled um a, you know a record release like everything was just canceled so I'm like here I am on a farm in New Zealand what do I do I have a little studio and I was extremely pro prolific I finished my um, rock EP, um, Elasticity, which is going to be released in February. Um, uh, and I also finished two albums of cinematic music I'll release this year and a 24 minute modern piano concerto that I'm also going to release. So I just wrote tons of music, like back to back. It was just like streaming out of me. Um, and that's because I was focused. That's because I had time and I had and I was in a place of peace to kind of regurgitate the, all, all my uh, impressions that I had gotten that I could now kind of sk hopefully skillfully put out through music. Um, so that's, that was a great time for me, like March, April, May, I guess. Um, and then, you know, besides these two songs, I've done a few collaborations and other stuff, but I haven't, I haven't been focused on music at all. I was actually going to ask too, like, what, what can you tell me about this EP that you have coming out in February? You said it was a rock, a rock record, which, should, you know, those don't come as often. Um, no. You got so many yeah. scores and stuff like that, which is fantastic too. But what, what can you tell me about the EP that's coming? Elasticity was, uh, the songs on that record, uh, the, on the EP were written many years back. And when I wrote them, um, the original concept was, you know, um, the original concept for me was, What's, what rock songs can come out of me right now that I could possibly work with System on? Um, so the, the intention was actually to sit down and I had played them for the guys and we even kind of messed around with some of them and whatnot. And obviously, you know, we weren't able to see uh, eye to eye on continuing the future uh, recordings of System, except for, you know, obviously these two songs for the cause that we've done. And, and that was, you know, before, obviously a couple of years before. So these songs, I decided to finish them myself and release them. Um, and they are, uh, they're really interesting and beautiful songs from uh, going from really heavy 
uh, type of system S type of music to really beautiful ballad -y, including pianos and string arrangements and stuff like that. So it's quite diverse for just five songs, um, you know, uh, and thematically it's quite diverse as well. Song about terrorism, a song about uh, protests in Armenia uh, years ago called Electric Yerevan, um, a song about um, my son Rumi, kind of, uh, you know, also cut with the poet Rumi in a way, like it, it's an homage to the poet Rumi and, and his namesake basically in a way. Um, and, and many, a few other pieces. So it's kind of like all around the place as, as everything I do is. Um, it was supposed to come out in October, but when the war started and when we decided to put out two songs with System, that took priority to me. And, you know, and I just called the record company that we're working with and just said, we need to push this. Can we make this work? And they were very cool about it. I should say we'll also be releasing the film Truth to Power um, early next year, kind of starting around the same time. Uh, we'll, we'll first kind of do a virtual, I think we're going to do a virtual theatrical going into, you know, the other aspects like TVOD and, you know, um, basically streaming is the last, you know, thing. And Truth to Power is a film, I think you and I have talked about it previously, but it's a film about um, my journey as an artist activist, you know, an activist journey through music. Obviously, it includes System of a Down, which is a huge part of my career uh, and, and life. And it includes a lot of stuff, my, you know, my youth and my motivations, what made me an activist and how I ended up in the revolution in Armenia in 2018 and, you know, the connections. And so it's quite interesting as a, you know, documentary in that sense, a music doc. So that's going to be out around the same time as, as the oh. EP. That's very cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to watching that. Thanks. Do you remember what, uh, you know, you, you said you were an activist before you were an artist. Do you remember what music made you want to make music? Do you remember what, like, brought you into being a musician? John Lennon, um, Bob Marley. Um, I mean, you know, artists that uh, not only did art for the sake of art, but also put something in because something fucking pissed them off, you know? Something made them speak out, speak truth to power or, or, or wanting to find justice in some ways, you know? Uh, the Beatles did it really well, you know? They have a song called Revolution and then all these other crazy songs on the same record, for example. Um, but many other artists really, uh, you know, I, I got a really, you know, Bob Dylan and, and uh, you know, Anyone who, uh, when you listen to them and their intentions behind their voice, it moves you in a different way, you know, beyond the music. Um, Bob Marley did it best because, in, in some ways, because he made you dance to activism. I mean, that's fucking incredible. So, because you could be an activist musician and just be doom and gloom, right? And just be like, oh, this is terrible. We got to change it. We got to break it. We got to do this. And Bob's like, oh, yeah, man, it's all going to be good, man, you know, but we got to change it and dance to it. Like, it's just using positive energy through activism. That, to me, was genius. Um, the Clash, Crass, another punk band, uh, a very crass punk band. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so many different, you know, from, from punk rock to rock to, you know, I mean, even Black Sabbath with War Pigs and, you know, like there's so many bands that aren't even known as socio-political bands that have incredible socio-political songs here and there. Um, so I think, yeah, a lot of influences. You know, you mentioned Lennon and Marley and Dylan and, you know, eventually Sabbath. But what was it that attracted you originally to, to heavy music? You've done so much since that, since the system. But what was it that brought you that figured that heavy music was the, the vehicle for what you wanted to say? I never decided that. It's the guys I started jamming with that were really into heavy music that made me a heavy musician. You know, mm -hmm. my my musical roots are, are way more uh, world music, jazz, pop, classical you know, you name it. Although I did listen to heavy music and my two influences, my the two people that really got me into heavy music were my brother, Sevag, who would play Slayer at home and, you know, and Darren, my guitarist. So when we started collaborating, he would play me all this heavy music. And um, at the time I had this really crazy thing and Darren did it as well, but we would both, not, not necessarily the same artists at the same time, but we would binge and purge on music. Uh, what that means is for 
three months, I would literally only listen to death metal music because because that's what got me off. And then three months, I'd be listening to hip hop. Three months, I'd be listening to punk. Like, and it, it's not like I decided it's going to be three months, but it's almost like you really get into one artist and you're like, where did this artist get their influences from? What other bands are there like this artist that I would like in that genre? And suddenly you're just listening to this plethora of just this particular genre, the best of it, the worst of it, maybe mm -hmm. even whatever you like. Right. And, uh, and that was really incredible musical education. Do you find that the, these sorts of eclectic, this background, like, like, like your three months of death metal all those years ago, that sort of thing, do you find that that translates into the, the classical music you've been writing? Do you find that these sorts of, these things, the eclecticism speaks through when you do focus on a genre? Because I'm guessing at this point, you probably have done more classical music, I guess, in the last 10 years than you have rock or any of the other genres. Do you find- Probably, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, it's interesting. My foray in classical was because of a, an e email from a, a New Zealand artist friend of mine. I was, it was around 2000, I want to say 2008, 2009. I was touring with the FCC on my first solo rock record, Elect the Dead. And I was in Seattle and uh, about to play a show. And I got an email from a friend of mine, uh, Bo Ranga, in New Zealand saying, hey, I have a good friend who's the head of marketing at the Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra, and he's interested in doing a show with you, something with you, you should hit him up and have a chat. And it was, and it was exciting. I had no idea. I'm like, huh, okay. So as soon as I finished the tour, I hit him up, had a chat. And then I remember sitting down and feeling really excited about the, the kind of opening of a new door musically. And so, um, so after doing that show, I worked with an incredible friend of mine who, you know, I just spoke to like two days ago, uh, composer John Sathas, who helped me with all the arrangements and helped me co-compose for, because I had zero classical chops at the time. Um, but I was, you know, I broke all my songs down to acoustic guitar or piano, which they were each written on, and vocals, and then started writing simple melodic string arrangements and, and you know, brass arrangements. I've done that with System over the years, by the way. Um, you know, on the songs, which you're barely hear it because obviously we've got a lot of drums and nine layers of guitars or whatever, but you'll hear whatever you hear from piano or strings is, you know, something I've arranged, but, um, but I really got into it and I did the concert, which we released on Warner as uh, elected that symphony, which, which was a concert CD DVD. And that really got me into that world. Like I really got excited. And so with my second solo album, um, in Perfect Harmonies, I tried to make this fusion record of classical, electronic elements, some rock elements, and just create a, a work of art with music. Um, and that's what I did. Um, and then that got me into scoring. And with scoring, you tend to use more classical, not always, I mean, it could be an electronic score, it could be a rock score, obviously, and I've, you know, I've, I've worked on those as well. But there are more electronic, there are more classical elements to scoring than anything else. So. I've been doing a lot of that. Then I wrote Orca, which is my symphony, and released it in 2013. Uh, and that's been played by orchestras around the world, which is incredible. I mean, as a composer, to just stand back and watch a 70-piece, 80-piece orchestra play your composition from side stage, it's not anything that a touring musician can ever experience unless he gets to, or she gets to do that it's kind of a whole different thing. Not necessarily better or worse. It's just when you're performing, um, you know, I, you know, when you're performing, you're, you're, you're in that flow, you're part of this thing. And, and that's beautiful as well, because I also perform with orchestra as well. But when they're playing your piece and each orchestra will play it differently, you know, and all of that, it's just this unique thing that you just get to experience. So I'm, I'm really grateful that I've mm -hmm. been able to do that. Since system reactivated, there's obviously the pause there. Do you, do you hear the music differently after doing these sorts of other things? Do you hear the music on stage or, or is it kind of what you're describing about where you're so into it that it, it's, it's sort of just this one feeling? But I mean, I was just sort of curious if after working on like a scores and that sort of thing and hearing all the different pieces of everything like that, do you, do you hear systems music differently? Kind of, yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's every, time, every time we do a tour and we get together for rehearsal, and we play a song we've played a thousand or maybe five thousand times between rehearsals and live shows. It, it's always 
it always is interesting because it goes, oh, fuck, that's really interesting. You know, it's, it's kind of, there's always a surprise to it. I think our songs are so surprising that when you're away from them, I mean, if you're playing them every day, it's like, you know, you have butter and toast every day, you know, it's like, <laughs> it is what it is, right? But when you're away from it and you, you know, or I'll, I'll sit and, you know, um, in a car and someone will be playing the music or hear it somewhere being played and you're just, without, without people knowing that I'm listening to it, I'll be like, that's really interesting, you know? Um, I think it's got surprises that will always be there and, and they always make me smile, our music. Um, because it's it's almost like British tongue in cheek humor in a way. You know, there's something funny about it always in the end. And yeah. of course, I also have the added ex, uh, pleasure of having the experiences around that music, how how it was formed, what stories, what jokes, what drama, what, whatever was around that particular piece of music or song. Um, and I think that's, that's cool. Um, but speaking of classical and system, you know, one day, and I've told Darren this, it's like one day we should really, you know, do that. Like we should, we should basically, you know, arrange a classical version of some system songs at least and play them with a nice proper orchestra like Metallica did, like other artists have. I think it would be uniquely different for system. Doing something crazy like Chop Suey with an orchestra would be incredible, but fast, like really fast tempo. Not like, da -da. No, 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 no. I'm talking about badass orchestra going da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, like just whatever we need to do, you know, and just, you know, like that would be insane, you know. So it sounds like you still have plans at some point in the future to do system stuff, even if it is older stuff. I know that there's always been like the you guys haven't been able to find the right way to make the right music. You haven't been able to agree on how you wanted to do that. So it sounds like you still are throwing out ideas here and there about what you could do rather than just saying, well, this will never happen. Right. I, look, the important thing to me is that we're all close friends. We all respect each other. We all love each other. Our kids hang out with each other. My drummer is my brother-in-law. I may hate his American politics, but I love his Armenian politics, you know. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, we're, we're family, you know, and we tour together. We enjoy each other. Uh, we'll disagree over stuff and we'll agree on stuff. Whatever we disagree over, we won't do. Whatever we agree over, we'll do. And it's that simple and it's that beautiful and it's that whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs>